Hi, I'm Alex Sudris, co-founder at Bold Method, and tonight we're gonna take a look at procedure turns. I think everybody gets a little bit nervous and stressed when you're flying an ILS down to minimums, but not nearly as stressed as you get when you realize you might have to fly a procedure turn. Possibly because in the real IFR world, we just don't do them very much. It could be because half the time we don't even know if we should be doing them, and they oftentimes end up with a lot of limits, and it can be a little bit hard to figure out. Tonight, we're gonna to take a look at the standard procedure turn and all of the reasons that it ends up not being standard. We've got Corey Comeric on chat tonight. He's gonna to help answer questions and take questions from you, feeding him off to Colin, who's running the switcher. And so, as we're going through this, if you have any questions, if there's something I say that you don't understand, shoot a question over via chat, and then we'll work it into the broadcast. Okay, so some of you may not even know what a procedure turn is. So we're gonna start out with a very basic, quick description of the standard basic procedure turn. And we're gonna use a chart from Liberal Kansas. So let's take a look at the iPad. We've got four flight up here. This is the VOR DME to runway 17. This is a Jepson chart. We'll look at a FAA chart as well in just a second. But a procedure turn is a maneuver that allows us to lose altitude while we turn around. And if you look at this approach, there's a couple different initial approach fixes here. The places where we can start our approach. One is liberal, that's the VOR, okay? One is a fix called Yenup. Another one is a fix called Opvo. And if you look at that, I'm gonna clear this out. If we start at Yenup or Opvo, we automatically line ourselves up and fly down final. In fact, it even says no PT for no procedure turn. But if we start over liberal, we fly outbound along the final approach course. So we need to turn ourselves around somehow. And that's the beauty of a procedure turn. A procedure turn gives you a way to turn around and lose altitude. And that's kind of the key here. By the time you cross liberal, you're not low enough to start final approach. They probably couldn't bring you in over here. So we need a procedure turn to lose altitude and turn ourselves around. So let's take a look at this. This procedure turn allows us to do almost anything we want, subject to a few restrictions. The first restriction, sorry. The first restriction you see on a procedure turn is you've got to remain within a required distance. In this case, it's 10 nautical miles, and in Jepson, they make it really easy to tell where you measure that distance from. In this case, it's from the VOR. It's from liberal. Number two, there's a direction that you can execute the turn in. And you can tell by looking at either the barb on an FAA chart or the procedure turn diagram on the Jepson chart. So in this case, the procedure turn needs to be executed on this side of the final approach course. Okay, now you notice that I kind of drew this entire area here because they show you this turn. And you can fly that turn, but really you can execute your procedure turn anywhere on this side as long as you remain within that 10 nautical miles posted on the chart. And then finally, when you look at a procedure turn, there's some altitude limits. Typically, a procedure turn is giving, going to give you an altitude to descend down to while going outbound. That's 4,600 feet in this case. And then once you turn around and you're established inbound, you're on that course inbound to the next fix, you can typically descend down to another altitude. And in that case, it's 4,000. So we're gonna take a look at a couple different examples of how you can start your turns and when, but it's important to remember that even though they draw what we call the standard 45, 180, 45 procedure turn. You fly outbound, you turn 45 degrees, you fly that for one minute, then you do a 180 degree U-turn, and you fly that in with a 45 degree intercept in a no-win scenario to intercept the final approach course. Even though they draw that turn, you could really do anything you want over here. You know, you could hit the VOR, and do a teardrop, you could fly a holding pattern, you could do a, what they call a 90, 280. One of the advantages with the 45, 180, 45 is it's 
fairly easy to fly if you've lost your heading indicator because you can time the turn. But let's take a look at some specific examples we're going to walk through and see how we'd actually fly one of these procedures. And we're going to start by looking at the different amount of distance that you'll see. And we're going to start with Liberal Kansas. So let's zoom out. The typical procedure turn needs to be completed within 10 miles. And so here you can see it's 10 miles from the VOR. That's your average procedure turn. Let's take a look at the FAA plate. So on an FAA plate, you're going to see it. It's still in this profile view here. And you can see that it says remain within 10 miles. One thing the FAA doesn't do is they don't write the name of the thing you got to stay within 10 miles of. Thankfully, Jeff Jepson does that. It's a big area of confusion. But the easiest way to tell is it's the fix where that outbound procedure to return descent starts from. So if you look at it here, this descent line starts from the liberal Vortac. And on an instrument check ride, you can bet you're going to get some questions. OK, so what fix do you start your procedure turn at? When can you start descending? On a standard procedure turn, you can start your descent to the outbound altitude as soon as you cross the procedure turn fix. In that case, in this case, it's liberal. You just need to remain within 10 nautical miles of liberal. OK, so we said 10 is kind of your average. But that can vary. And there's really two common cases that you'll see. Number one is the five mile procedure turn. So this is a Jepson plate. You can see it says five miles. They have not said from the VOR because on this procedure, it's fairly obvious, really the only fix outside the missed approach fix is the VOR. But you can see we need to remain within five miles here. And that's also a signal that this procedure is going to be a category A only procedure. If it's a CAT A only procedure, the FAA can tighten up the, or the procedure designer can tighten up that procedure turn limit to five miles. And you see category B, C, and D here on this procedure is not authorized. That gives them some flexibility. If there's some airspace, um, we'll take a look here, I'm gonna zoom out. If there's some airspace that conflicts, like in this case, these restricted areas that you can see um, right here, you got these two restricted areas, they may not be able to get a procedure turn on this approach that gets out to 10 nautical miles, and so they couldn't publish an approach. So what they'll do is they'll just limit it to five and category A aircraft can still make it into the field. Okay, let's take a look at the other common case. This one you're gonna see at airfields that are typically, or sorry, this is the FAA version here. So you can see in the FAA version, it says right here, remain within five nautical miles. So let's take a look at that other common case. And as I said, you're gonna see this typically at fields that are used by the military. And in this case, they can extend a procedure turnout up to 15. So let me uh, zoom in on that. You can see it here again in the profile view. In this case, we can go out to 15 nautical miles from the VOR, and that's for all categories. So you can see it's based off the VOR here because that's where the line starts from. We could take it out to 15 nautical miles. And let's take a look at the FAA plate so you can see what that looks like as well. So if you're using FAA charts, same thing. BVL Vortec remain within 15 nautical miles. And again, they're designing this procedure for high performance aircraft as well as category aircraft. So you're gonna see in this case, you have minimums all the way through category E. Um, and you'll find a lot of procedures don't have category E minimums. So common distances, 10, five, or 15. A lot of people assume every procedure turn is always 10, but commonly it could be 10, five, or 15. But sometimes, they'll come up with their own distance. And this is the localizer DME runway 26 in Silver City, New Mexico. Looking at the profile view here, you can see in this case that it's 11 nautical miles. So it's kind of a random custom dis difference. And so again, one of the issues we see, especially on check rides, but it happens out there as well, in, in actual IFR flying is people just assume, I need to remain within 10 miles. And on a procedure like this, if you need a little extra altitude to descend, you've got an extra mile. In some cases, you might have 15. In others, you may choose not to execute the procedure because your aircraft um, 
you know, may not be able to meet the descent within a five mile procedure trend limitation. And again, here, it's remaining within 11 miles from Cozy. You can see they've written that on a Jepson chart. They're doing that to make sure that you don't get confused as where you're, me where you're measuring the distance from. But you can also tell because that procedure turn line starts at Cozy. If you're using an FAA chart as opposed to a Jepson chart, I'm getting used to these gestures. I've had iPads for about six years now, and I still get tripped up on them every once in a while. Um, if you're using an FAA chart, you can see they just say remain within 11 miles. They don't tell you where that's from, but again, you can see the procedure turn starts. It starts coming down, the Alpine one, at the cozy uh, locator outer marker. And so that's where you've got to stay 11 miles from. Again, that's something if you're getting ready for an instrument check ride, just looking at the profile view and determining where you're going to measure your procedure turn distance from, that's definitely a big deal. It can trip people up. Okay, so here's the deal. When we were talking about that, how do we measure our distance? Well, you can measure your distance typically through RNAV. I would say now that's probably the most common, but you can also measure your distance through DME. And the third way is through time which everybody forgets about, but it's a great way. And there's certain procedures where that's all you've got, um, but it's either gonna be RNAV, DME, or time. So let's take a look at the RNAV case. And we'll use this procedure right here. It says remain within 11 miles. If we fly this procedure, RNAV is gonna give us distance from COSY. So as long as we don't see our RNAV distance exceed 11 miles, we're good to go. Okay, but what happens if we're using DME? Well, if we, you're using DME, you can't measure your distance from this fix. So you're gonna have to measure it from ISVC. And ISVC, the I is a hint, the I means localizer, it's the DME coming off the localizer. So that, COSY, is 5.2 DME from the localizer. So we'd add 11 miles, and that gets us to 16.2 DME. Okay, so this really gets confusing when you're looking at a chart and you're trying to decide between RNAV distances and DME distances, especially with an RNAV procedure. Okay, how far do I need, how far can I go out? If you flew an RNAV, if you flew this procedure using RNAV out to 16 DME, you'd be way too far because it's going to measure its distance from COSY. So one of the first things I always say is look at your GPS or your flight plan or your DME unit, figure out where you're measuring that distance from. That is a big area that trips people up on check rides, especially with RNAV, they'll just say, you know, they'll, they'll look at the DME distance, they'll add 10 to it, and they don't realize that the RNAV system is actually measuring distance from effects. I can tell you that's starting to slowly go away. Uh, fewer and fewer aircraft have DME and people are just getting used to using RNAV, but especially if you have both systems on an airplane, it can get a little bit confusing. Okay, so let's actually look at this in practice. Uh, I've got, we did an animation here uh, from Liberal, Kansas. It's the VOR DME Runway 17. Uh, and you can see I've got it up right here. So we've been uh, assigned Giddy on this. Let me actually pull it up in four flight. We'll look at it first in four flight so you can see it. Uh, one second. Make sure I'm looking at the right one here. Okay. So in this case, we're going to use the initial approach fix of the liberal Vortac. And we're going to come in, cross over the Vortac, fly outbound and then execute our procedure turn. So we know that we need to stay within 10 nautical miles from the Vortac. And if we fly this, if you look at our fix, what we're gonna find is that both DME and GPS will measure their distance from Liberal. So whether you're using a traditional DME unit, we're using RNAV. In this case, you're going to measure your distance from the Liberal 
uh, VOR, VOR tech, I think in this case. And so on our airplane, we fly out at about 120 knots. I typically start my turn about five miles out and I like to make my turn away from the final approach fix. So I'll come out this way. I have two options. I can turn right away from the final approach fix or I can turn left towards the final approach fix. The reason I almost always will make that right turn is because now I have more distance on my final approach or my intermediate segment leading me in on the final approach course. And that gives me more distance to descend. So, you know, in this procedure, I'm going to descend down to 4,600 feet while I'm outbound. And then, once I'm established inbound, I'm going to lose 6,000 feet by Tunby. If I make a turn to the right, I usually end up a little closer to these fixes than I want. So I tip, or sorry, I turn towards the final approach fix. I usually end up a little closer to these fixes than I want. So I'm almost always going to make my turn away from the final approach fix. Now, there are a few situations where I'm going to turn towards the final approach fix. The biggest one is if winds caught me by surprise and I'm picking up distance a lot faster than I thought and I feel like I'm getting close to my limit, then I will turn around towards the final approach fix. Looks like we've got a question. Okay, I'm going to hop in here. We've got a really good question from Chelsea. And actually, I'm going to kind of back to back these. Uh, but we're going to start with this. Um, Chelsea's question is, do you need a clearance from ATC to begin the procedure turn? Yes and no. Um, when you're cleared for the approach or when you're cleared for the procedure, that means that you're cleared for a procedure turn. But they're not going to specifically tell you to do the procedure turn. And we're going to do a separate session on no PT and PT and straight in. But the key is if ATC does not vector you onto the final approach course, if, they, if you're not flying a timed approach from a holding fix, which is fairly rare, um, if they do not use the words cleared for a straight in approach, or if the route that you're flying, either a feeder route or the initial approach segment does not say no PT, then that clearance for the approach is a clearance for the procedure turn and you need to execute the procedure turn. Procedure turns are really never optional. Um, when ATC clears you, either you're on an OPT route or you're not. Either you're getting radar vectors to final and you're cleared straight in or you're not. Uh, now, you can always fly a procedure turn if you need it. So let's say they've cleared you straight in and you're going, yeah, I, you know, there's a hold lure procedure turn. You go, I need to lose some altitude. You can always ask ATC to execute the procedure turn. Um, but it depends on your kind of clearance. We got another question. Okay, so uh, second question, and you may not want to answer this right away, but I know you're going into this uh, in this animation, Alex, and this comes from Jason. Um, do you choose when you want to start your descent on a procedure turn, or do you start it right away as you cross the fix? Okay, so first of all, the descent along a procedure turn and along an approach is essentially a pilot discretion descent as long as you meet any mandatory altitude restrictions, which most procedures don't have, most of them are at or above, and you can tell because it's an altitude with a line underneath it, most of them are at or above, the descent along a procedure turn is a pilot's discretion descent. And there's a few reasons that you may want to delay your descent. Normally, I'm going to start down right away. Uh, but if it's icing conditions, uh, even with our de-icing systems running, if I don't need that entire outbound leg to descend to the outbound altitude, I'll typically stay high. I'll stay out of the clouds. Um, I try to stay, I mean, flying an IMC is fun. If it's me, if, it's, if I'm flying with Colin or other pilots, if I'm flying with passengers, kind of stay above the clouds a little bit longer. It makes people feel a little bit better, but it is completely uh, your discretion. And you can start it, so actually, let's take a look here. We're going to fly this liberal procedure, um, but there's a couple things that I want you to see. If we go to the iPad, typically, unless the chart indicates otherwise, you can start your descent on the outbound turn as soon as you cross the procedure turn fix. So if I'm coming to liberal like this, and I'm using traditional navigation where I don't have turn anticipation, I'm going to go across it, then I'm going to come over, 
and I'm gonna establish myself outbound on this course, I can start my descent to my initial outbound altitude. On this procedure, 4,600 feet, oops, sorry. I can start my descent as soon as I cross that liberal vortex. So let's take a look at another scenario. Let's say I'm coming in from this direction and I cross, now I gotta go way out and back, right? So I'll probably turn a little sooner than that, but it's gonna look a little bit like that. So when can I start my descent? Even though people will call this the non-protected side, it is protected as part of the procedure turn entry area. And so as soon as I cross that VOR, I can start my descent to the outbound procedure turn altitude, unless the chart indicates otherwise. And stick with me for a second, because we will actually take a look at that in Canyonlands. But basically, as soon as I cross that PT fix, in this case, the VOR, as I'm turning to intercept my outbound course, I can go down to my outbound procedure turn altitude. However, I cannot start my descent to my next inbound altitude until I am established on either the intermediate or final segment that is leading me in to that fix. So, okay, let's take a look at this and fly it. Okay, so in this case, we're on our way to Liberal, and I believe our clearance is 216 Bravo Delta, Class Liberal Vortac, at or above 5,500, cleared for the VOR DME approach, runway 17 Liberal. So we're gonna fly over. If you take a look at our route, we're gonna fly over to Liberal, track outbound, and fly the procedure turn. So here we go. We're on our way into Liberal, and you can see if you look over here, I've got both GPS and DME distance. And we've got a good view of the profile view down here so you can look at all of them. In this case, both of these procedures are measuring my distance from Liberal. So you can see, or both, both the GPS and the DME are measuring my distance from Liberal. So this makes measuring the procedure turn no matter what system you're using pretty simple. And you can see right here, we're coming through 5,600, I'm meeting my crossing restriction, and I'm turning to fly outbound along the procedure turn. And so I'm continuing my descent, and I'm gonna go all the way down to 4,600 feet. You're gonna see it shortly pop up over here in the profile view. And I'm gonna speed this guy along as we fly outbound. You can see I'm flying the procedure outbound, and I'm gonna start my turn right about five miles. So I'm going up to five miles. There's my five miles, and I'm gonna start my procedure turn. Now keep in mind, if you're using ForeFlight, the airplane, and you're flying the procedure turn on your own, the airplane will not necessarily be right on top of the procedure turn depiction. You could be out here or out here. They're much more accurate now that they're to scale, obviously, but you're not necessarily gonna be on that specific racetrack, and it's not your goal to fly the procedure turn right on that racetrack. So, now I'm turning away from the final approach course, okay? And I can keep descending, I just can't get below 4,600. So you can see that's what I've leveled off at. And now I'm executing my procedure turn. I'm gonna fly this leg for one minute. And I start my one minute time once I roll wings level outbound. Um, some people start it right as they start the turn. It's really up to you. And then after one minute, I'm gonna execute a 180 degree turn to pick up my intercept inbound. Typically 45 degrees. If I'm facing a really strong headwind coming down final approach course, a headwind from here, I'll turn more. If there's a tailwind at altitude, I'll turn less. So now we're on our way in, and what you'll notice is I'm still at 4,600 MSL. Even though you might think I'm on the inbound part of the procedure turn, so can't I start down to 4,000? You can't start down until you're established. You can start the outbound descent, or descent to the outbound altitude right after you cross the procedure turn fix. You do not need to be established. But the inbound altitude, you have to be established on that intermediate or final approach segment. So you're gonna see me come in, and you can see both the GPS and the DME showed the entire time 
that I'm basically within the procedure turn distance. At 120 knot ground speed, I find that when I start a procedure turn, if I turn away from the final approach fix, I had about 3.3 miles to my distance total. So if I start at five, I'll end up at about 8.3. And this point in time, I'm completing the procedure turn. Now that I'm established inbound, I'm going down to 4,000 feet and my procedure turn's done. And from here, I'm established on the intermediate segment, flying down to the final approach fix. Okay, so that's the key with the standard procedure turn. When you cross the fix that starts the procedure turn, you can go down to the outbound altitude, even though you're not necessarily established on a course yet. There's a caveat to that if the chart says you can't, and we'll look at one of those examples in a bit. But you can't start your descent to the next inbound altitude until you've intercepted the course back inbound. Okay, we got a question. Okay, we actually have, we've got a lot of questions here and a lot of really good ones, but uh, I'm going to start off with this one uh, because it really ties into what we just talked about. How do you, in a procedure turn, um, calculate your turn so you properly intercept the inbound radial? Any rules of thumb? Uh, maybe talk about wind a little bit um, and, and things like that. Okay, that is a really, really good question. Um, first of all, when I started flying an instrument, uh, when I started training for my instrument rating, uh, we did not have a GPS with a moving map. Uh, we just had a KLN 89B. Uh, there was actually, I think it was a version previous to that. So there was no way to really see if I'm intercepting that final approach course. That being said, I've seen a lot of people in airplanes not look at the moving map to see if the moving map, on the moving map, if they're actually moving to intercept the final approach course. So that, that will help you. But typically, in a no-wind scenario, 45 degrees is a good number. Um, if you're facing a headwind along final approach course. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this animation. I'll draw it in here. If you're facing a headwind, you could add 10 or 20 degrees of intercept depending on the strength of the headwind. It also depends on your ground speed. So if you're flying this in a 172 at 90 knots and you've got a 30 knot headwind, you could easily end up using a 65, maybe even a 70 degree intercept angle to pick up that final approach. One thing you need to be very careful about is as you increase that intercept angle that you don't take such a large angle that you end up flying through the final approach course. So the larger your intercept angle, you really wanna watch that turn. Now keep in mind that headwind will slow that needle as it comes on, but you wanna watch that turn. If you have a crosswind from here, you watch that turn on the final. But it's kind of a rule of thumb for your airplane. Um, one of the other things, uh, a lot of people don't use flight sim, and it's because flight sim doesn't give them real realistic control feel. But what flight sim does do is a fantastic job of simulating winds and ground speeds. And this doesn't just have to be like a, a flight simulator. It could just be your GPS simulator. If you've got a Garmin GPS simulator, a G1000 simulator, one of the best things you can do is set up your airspeed at your kind of your your initial approach speed and put in several different kind of headwinds or tailwinds and see what works for you at the speed you're flying your approach at. The faster you fly, the less angle you're going to need. Um, but doing that and then always flying the same set of speeds on a procedure makes it much more predictable. Okay, we got another question. Okay, next question up here is uh, with the procedure turn, is it a heading or a track? Ah. I'm not supposed to say that's a great question because I say it too much, but that is a, it's a really good question. I like that uh, because that gets so confusing when you look at charts, you're like, wait a second, is this, I, do I fly this heading or do I fly this track? It is a heading. Um, it's a heading on the chart. So if you look at, uh, I'm going to rewind just a little bit here. Um, if you look at this, you can see this procedure turn. It's a 331 heading and it's a 151 heading inbound. So 331 outbound, 151 inbound. Those are suggested headings, and you'll change those for your wind correction angle. Now, now we have GPS, and, and GPS will fly the procedure turn for you. Uh, in fact, in many aircraft, G1000, NXI, autopilot equipped aircraft, a Cirrus, a Cessna, um, we can just let the autopilot do it. And the GPS will fly a track. It won't tr fly the track necessarily that's published, but it will choose and fly a track. Uh, but if you take all that away, 
Those numbers are just recommended headings and you're going to make adjustments for wind. And again, you know, it really depends on the airspeed you're flying your approach at. That's somewhere, if you get into a simulator, um, you know, just use like a flight sim or a GPS simulator, you can dial in those speeds and see what angles work for you. It also emphasizes the importance of always flying a procedure at the same indicated airspeed uh, because then you know, based off the winds, how much of an angle to take, how much of a wind correction angle to take so that you don't get blown off course. Okay, in this situation, you can see that both GPS and DME um, on the outbound segment, so if we go you know, back here to where we're outbound, rewind a little bit more, both of them are measuring our distance from liberal. And that makes this very, very easy because the procedure measures its distance from liberal, so we just gotta stay within 10 nautical miles. That's cake, no problem. But that's not always the scenario. So let's take a look at another one. Um, we're gonna take a look at Delta Utah. So let me load that up. That's KDTA, and I'm gonna hit pause here, and we'll start by looking at the chart. So I'm gonna switch over to four flight. And we're gonna pull up Delta. Okay, this is the VOR DME to runway 17. If you look, the procedure turn starts at Giddy, which is a combination of an initial fix or an intermediate fix and an initial approach fix. That's because you're gonna cross it once as the initial approach fix, execute the procedure turn, and then cross it again as an intermediate fix. Now, you'll notice that the procedure turn on this looks super small, but don't let that mislead you because if you look down at the bottom, you can see in this case, we need to remain within 10 nautical miles from Giddy. So even though if you look at that procedure to scale, this has been drawn as a super small procedure turn, you really have up to 10 nautical miles. So here's a question. If we're using DME, where are you gonna measure your distance from? Well, you're not gonna measure it from Giddy because that's just a fix. So you're gonna to have to measure it from Delta. That's where Giddy's DME is defined. It's D18.0. And they don't write the name of the facility because it's assumed. The only facility depicted on the chart with DME, um, and that is that little d right there on a Jepson plate. The only facility on this chart is Delta. So what that means, since you have a 10 nautical miles from Giddy distance limit, you would need to stay either, if you're using RNAV, 10, or if you're using DME, you'd add roughly 10 to that, which gets you to 28. That works pretty well, as long as the DME facility is right in line with the final approach course. But keep in mind, if you were to draw some arcs, if you drew some circles here, a 10 mile circle from Giddy, and then you drew a larger one coming off, a 20 mile coming off of, or a 28 mile coming off of the localizer, they really end up being different distances. And so they're only gonna be accurate right here. If you're staying within 28 miles and you're off somewhere over here, you'll actually probably be outside of the protected area. So it's one advantage of RNAV. And if you're using DME and DME isn't measured from the procedure turn fix, I always like to give it a couple tenths of a, of a mile of padding so we don't get too far out. So let's actually go fly this. Okay, so we're on our way into Giddy. And there's another thing on here and I didn't bring it up in the chart, but you can see here, this has a maximum procedure turn entry altitude of 10,000 feet. So typically, when you receive your clearance, ATC will say cross at or above, and in this case, that at or above will be below 10,000 feet, but even though they say at or above, you need to make sure you are below 10,000 feet for this procedure turn. So I think in this case, they say um, Cirrus 216 Bravo Delta, you are uh, direct giddy, cross giddy at or above 9,800 feet cleared for the VOR DME runway 17 approach in Delta, Utah. Okay, so let's start flying this. So we go in, you can see we're already descending down to make this 10,000 feet crossing restriction here. And as we come into giddy, you'll notice that our GPS is measuring distance from Giddy, as expected. But if we have DME, 
It's measuring from DTA. And as we cross DTA, you're going to see that go up to 18. And this is where things can get a little bit confusing and tricky. And that is you'll notice if you're using RNAV, you don't want to go out further than 10 miles. If you're using DME, no more than 28 because we have to add 10 to that 18. Okay, so again, I, in this case, started my uh, turn about three miles out. I'm going to do a left turn again to give myself some room on final. So I'm turning away from the final approach fix. And you'll notice I'm at 9,100 feet. And that's because if you look, the minimum outbound altitude is 9,100 feet. And I can't start my descent again until I intercept the final approach course. And at that point, now I can start coming down to my 7,600 foot altitude. Okay, so again, the key thing here on this procedure is that if you look at the actual procedure itself, the distances and the maxes are going to be different depending on whether you're using GPS or RNAV, where it's going to measure its distance from the procedure turn fix typically. And in that case, it's going to, you need to stay within 10 miles versus DME. And in that case, you're measuring from some other source and you need to add that distance to the fixed distance so that adding 10 would get us to 28. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm going to clear this out at another scenario where DME really isn't even an option. You might think it is, um, but it really isn't a good option. And it's because the DME is offset from the approach and you can't use DME to identify the fixes. And this is going to be in Kalispell, Montana. It's the ILS or localizer runway two. So let's take a look at that in four flight. Okay, Kalispell, the name will fool you. It's GPI for Glacier Park International. And this is the ILS or localizer runway two. We're going to start at this initial, or we're going to start at a feeder fit, or on a feeder route here. We're going to start at the Kalispell VOR. From there, we're going to follow a feeder route with a minimum altitude of 9,100 to the SAC NDB. Okay, so this is the SAC NDB right here, Smith Lake, SAK. It looks like it's on the final approach course, but it's not. It's really, really, really close. Now, typically, you'll see NDBs used over the outer marker um, or maybe over the middle marker. They're called locator outer markers or locator, locator middle markers, but SAC isn't. And this is an area, especially on a check ride or an interview, uh, where they could trip you up. And the reason you know that is because a locator either is always, it's always a two-letter identifier, and this is a three-letter identifier. An outer marker is going to be SA, and a locator middle marker would be named AK as opposed to SAC. Actually, it would be named after the glide slope or the localizer. So it would be either GP or PI. Um, but in this case, SAC just happens to be an NDB that's aligned with not quite on the localizer course. So we're going to fly from 9100 to SAC. From there, we're going to turn outbound. Um, and we're going to fly the procedure turn. The outbound course is 200. Then we're going to execute the turn and turn inbound. So essentially, SAC's going to get you close enough to the localizer that you can turn right on. But the problem is, if you look at SAC, if you're trying to use DME, okay, the procedure turn is measured from the SAC NDB. But the NDB doesn't have DME associated with it. There are NDBs that have DME. This one does not. And you'll notice nowhere on here does it give you a distance from FCA or Kalispell? So you cannot use DME to identify this. It's not a certified part of the procedure. Typically, you might see something like D9.1. But in this case, you can't. Okay, so if you look at it, you could say, well, I know it's 13 miles here. So you could say, you know, if I add 10 to that, and draw that, it'd be 23.1. And that would be fairly close, but the problem is this VOR is offset off to the side. You can see it over here. And so that number is not gonna be perfect. So technically, you really can't use DME to measure this procedure turn. If you did, I would give yourself some padding. I'd take off a mile or so and maybe say, I wanna stay within 21 nautical miles as opposed to 23. But you can use RNAV. You can use RNAV to fly the procedure. 
because RNAV will measure your distance from the SAC NDB. The other thing, if you didn't have RNAV, um, you could still fly this procedure. DME isn't required. RNAV isn't required. Only an ADF is required so that you can get to the initial approach fix. You could time this procedure. And in that case, if I'm going 120 knots, about two miles a minute, I like to start my turn at five miles, as long as it's a standard 10 mile limit. So I'm gonna fly outbound for two minutes and 30 seconds. And then from there, I'll do my standard procedure turn, intercept and track inbound. And that should keep me, you know, probably around the seven and a half to the eight DME or eight distance, uh, eight nautical mile limit. If I'm flying 90 knots, 90 knots a mile and a half, I'm gonna typically execute my turn after three minutes and 20 seconds. Okay, so let's actually fly this procedure. Okay, so you can see us coming inbound to Kalispell. We're gonna cross Kalispell. Let's say we get a crossing restriction, Cirrus 6 Bravo Delta, cross Kalispell at or above 10,000, cleared for the ILS runway two. That clearance right there now allows us to descend to the minimum altitude on the feeder route. So in this case, we're gonna go down to 9,100. So you can see us going down, and I'm gonna to try to time my descent so that I hit 9,100 right at SAC. That way I can keep kind of an even descent going. If you don't have vertical path navigation, uh, but you do have a blue banana bar, you can just simply watch that on your MFD, if you've got that, and kind of keep that right over the fix. And that's a great way to adjust your descent rate so you kind of meet your crossing altitude as you get close. Okay, so in this case, Smith Lake, SAK is our initial approach fix. We're gonna cross it right at 9,100 feet, and we're gonna to start to fly outbound. You can see in this case, we cannot use DME. So we're just using GPS. But GPS, in this case, would be measuring our distance from SAC. If you look at your flight plan, it would, SAC, it would say SAK IAF through the procedure turn. So at five miles, we'll start our outbound turn. 45 degree turn and roll, swing, roll wings level, that's when I start the one minute timer. We've kind of sped this up a little bit. As it hits one minute, I'm gonna start my 180 degree turn around to re-intercept. Again, I'm turning away from the fix to give myself as much descent distance. But you'll notice, it really doesn't make a difference on this procedure because on this procedure, the 7800 outbound altitude limitation is also my inbound limitation. So you'll find some procedure turns, you'll go down on the outbound leg and that's, that's all you can descend. So you don't have to complete that entire descent on the outbound leg, you can complete as you turn inbound if you want. From there, we're gonna reach Jolek, which in this case is our final approach fix today because it's our glide slope intercept. And from there, we're going to fly the procedure down. There's something else that's kind of interesting about this procedure that kind of confuses people. And you'll see this every once in a while. You typically see it on a plan view. It's a little bit easier when you're looking at a Jepson plate. You'll notice, or on a profile view, you'll notice that the profile view with SAK, NDB, Smith-like, it doesn't, extend all the way to the ground. And that's a hint that the NDB is not part of that final approach course, that it's off of the final approach course or that it doesn't have a role on the final approach course. And so even though you see it there, it can be confusing. You might be looking for your step down there because a Jepson plate doesn't extend it all the way down. You can tell that it doesn't play a role in final approach. If you look at this on a um, FAA plate, it's a little bit more confusing because you do still see the standard line, uh, but the way you would know it doesn't have a rule is there's no altitude restrictions or anything like that published on it. Okay, a um, couple of the things you saw on one of the, the past procedures, there was an entry limitation of 10,000 feet. And again, uh, it is the descent down to a crossing restriction is pilot discretion. Actually, it looks like we had a question, so I'll jump into that first. All right, let's hop in here. Yeah, because we've got a, a bunch of uh, really good questions here uh, now that we've gone through these. We'll start off with Mark's, and that is, uh, on the procedure turn, if the wind pushes you further than the distance limit for the procedure the procedure turn, should you go missed? Uh, and then, uh, if that's the case, should you fi fly the published missed approach procedure? That's a really good question. Um, so first of all, if you were to do that on a check ride, uh, you've exceeded a limitation on the procedure, and so that would be a failure. Um, 
And the problem is you've gone outside of the protected airspace as designated by the procedural designer. So the first thing that I would say, and let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at a simpler one here. Let's go to, um, let's go to SVC, Silver City. So if you look at Silver City, let me clear out my drawing. The area is protected out to 11 miles from Cozy. But if you found yourself somewhere out here, maybe 13 miles away, now you could have a, a train obstruction clearance issue. And so in that case, what you really should do is climb to your MSA altitude. You would want to fly the missed approach procedure, but you would also want to use your MSA altitude, which goes out to 25 nautical miles. That's going to get you above any terrain in the area. Because the problem is once you exceed that protected distance, there could be a collision issue. You could have ground terrain that you're worried about. So that's a good time when you'd use the MSA. So here's a question. Could you just get yourself going back inbound, reestablish you know, re and descend down? You know, you, you probably could. Chances are ATC um, didn't even notice it. Um, but here's the deal. If you let yourself get blown out of the procedure turn limit, you're probably going to be pretty flustered. Uh, things aren't going your way. And so the issue that I see there is now you're proceeding down final, already frustrated with yourself. Not a bad idea to break off the approach and you know sit down in a holding pattern, brief it, reevaluate re how you want to fly it so you don't make any mistakes. But if you were to go outside of that protected area, first thing you want to do is get yourself up to the MSA or rejoining final and uh, starting the missed approach procedure. Okay, next question. Okay, next up, uh, Michael's question is, if the chart says no PT, can you ask for a procedure turn if you're still too high for the approach and you need time to get yourself down? You sure can. Um, and so let's actually take a look. I think Colin and I used this when we were flying in North Bend. So I'm gonna pull up Nor uh, or Newport, K, no, Astoria, K-A-S-T. Okay. And the procedure we were flying in Astoria was the ILS to runway 26. And we were originally on the DME arc, uh, but we were actually extremely high for traffic. And so we ended up entering this holding pattern and descending down. And so that gave us room to descend, but that's something we had to coordinate with ATC. And that's as simple as saying, hey, uh, we need a little bit to lose altitude. It could be to set up, it could be for any reason you want. So we just said, yeah, center six Bravo Delta, uh, can we fly the pattern over Zinke? And we need a couple turns. And they said, yeah, six Bravo Delta, hold west or, or hold east over Zinke as published. And then they said, expect further clearance at, because they need to give you an EFC um, or until requested inbound. So basically they're saying, yep, enter that holding pattern, do what you want and tell. And so, yeah, if you need the procedure turn to lose altitude, don't rush the procedure. In fact, when you look at instrument approaches, you're already really busy. The weather's bad, you're doing lots of turns, you're trying to lose altitude, you may be trying to keep the engine warm. I know for us, that can be an issue, especially in cold areas. So, you know, I need space sometimes. And flying the procedure turn or a couple loops around a hold and lure procedure turn is a really good way to lose altitude. And actually, um, let's take a look at Helena. That's kind of got an example where I think they anticipated this. So this is the VOR Alpha circling approach into Helena, Montana. This is the simplest approach you could ever fly. You cross over the VOR, then you fly the procedure turn and you come inbound. Uh, but ATC is anticipated, they may leave you high. Um, and if you think about it, Helena's in the, uh, in the, in the Montana Rockies. And so they've put an instruction right here. Descend to 10,000 in Helena VOR holding pattern prior to departing outbound for the procedure turn. So if you were to get a clearance, it sends it something like um, Cirrus 6 Bravo Delta, cross Helena at or above 10,000, cleared for the VOR Alpha. And we're tracking in, okay? And we ended up here at 13,000 feet. In this case, the procedure tells us to enter the holding pattern and fly it until we hit 10,000 feet. And at that point, fly outbound and fly the procedure turn. So you'd stay in the holding pattern until you can cross the VOR at 10,000 feet and fly the procedure turn. Now, 
Chances are, if I was actually flying that in real life and I realized that was a scenario that I, that I had that I wasn't going to be able to make it down to 10,000, I would just advise ATC that I'm going to fly the pattern, even though it is a charted part of the procedure, that pattern is considered part of the procedure. I'd let them know that way I don't surprise them. Okay, we get another question. Okay, that actually ties in pretty well to what you just said, Alex. Um, so Jason's question is this. Um, if you're doing a procedure turn and you're not descending fast enough uh, and you realize it as you're turning yourself inbound, should you alert ATC and go missed or should you do another turn and continue the approach? So in a procedure turn, first of all, a 45 degree procedure turn. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the iPad again. In this typical procedure turn right here, where you're gonna go out and in, there is no provision to repeat that turn because the procedure turn isn't the holding pattern. They've created a holding pattern. It's a missed approach hold they're using for both purposes, but they've created a holding pattern to lose altitude in. But there's no really no way to repeat this procedure turn. Um, you could have a hold in lieu of procedure turn. And in that case, let me, let me pull one of those up. Because that's the other really common thing that people see. Um, we'll go to Astoria. I think the ILS has one. And we'll clear that. So in this case, you can see Zinke is an initial approach fix and an intermediate fix. And this pattern right here is a hold in lieu of procedure turn. So it seems like, wow, that'd be really easy to stay in there. In a hold and lua procedure turn, if you want to fly more than one turn, you need to ask ATC. So if you realize in the middle of the entry, man, I'm not gonna make it down, I'm gonna be high, just click on and say center six Bravo Delta, uh, can I get a couple extra turns to lose altitude? So in that case, chances are no problem. The reason they need to know is they may be sequencing another aircraft in behind you. And if that's the case, they're counting on your airspeed and your approach speed to get you out of there fast enough so that that other aircraft doesn't create a collision hazard. If you fly another turn, you mess up their spacing and they may not notice it right away. On a 45-180 procedure turn, you're kind of stuck. If you end up high, there aren't a lot of very good options. So the answer is absolutely. Go missed, but you probably won't have to fly the entire missed approach procedure. What I would do is start my climb to my missed approach altitude, or if I'm above my missed approach altitude, I would just stay at the altitude I'm at, fly along the lateral portion while I call ATC. And chances are, as soon as you're above their minimum vectoring altitude, they're just going to send you back to the fix and let you do it again. So that's, that's kind of how I would approach that. Okay, I got one more procedure here, um, and that's Canyonlands. One of the things that I mentioned is that you can start your descent typically, right after you cross the procedure turn fix. And in this case, it is the Moab VOR. So we go like this, we can start our descent to the outbound altitude, typically right here. But there is an exception to that, and that's when they've given you a charted limitation. And Moab's got one of the few, it's one of the few procedures where I've been able to find it. The way the limitation is depicted depends on whether you're flying with Jepson or FAA charts. Uh, Jepson's not an advertiser. We buy their procedures. I think they are fantastic, and this is one reason why. Jepson writes it out very clearly here, maintain 7100 or above until established outbound for the procedure turn. And that's because there's an obstacle in the procedure turn entry area that the uh, procedure designer found. So in that case, so again, my, my altitude I'm gonna go down to is 7,000 feet outbound. So if I'm coming in here, and I cross Moab and say I'm coming in from this direction. Boom, I cross the VOR. I'm still going to stay at my crossing assigned altitude. You know, ATC would typically give you a clearance. They, they would say cross Moab at or above. I would then stay at that at or above altitude until I am established outbound on the outbound course. And then I would start my descent down to 7,000 feet because of the snow. So let's see what the FAA says about it, how you see it on their procedure. In their case, they do this. Sorry, they, they draw an underline over the altitude. Okay, so the problem that I have with that is just simply that it's really easy to miss that number um, or not know what it means. 
I mean, it makes sense. It's at or above. Stay at or above when you cross it. But, but um, I kind of like the Jepson note because it's easier to not miss. Okay, looks like we have another question. Okay, get another question from Chelsea here. Uh, and this is kind of a, uh, an overarching question. What are the most common mistakes while making a procedure turn? So there's a couple. Um, one of them is knowing where you're measuring your distance from. And I know we've kind of talked about that probably a little bit too much. Um, but the reality is that right there is something that people can get caught, caught up on and confused from. Sorry, I'm going to turn off the pen so I can zoom in. So on this one here, it's very simple. We're measuring it from the Moab VRDME. Um, and you can tell, you can always tell, because it's where the procedure turn outbound altitude or outbound descent starts from. But um, if you look at a procedure with lots of fixes, sometimes that can get a little bit confusing. Um, another thing um, is if you don't have uh, RNAV, if you're using DME, measuring distance. So let's take a look at one of those again. Um, let's see. I'll go in here. Yeah, Cozy is a good example. So I'm going to clear this out. So if we look at Cozy, our procedure needs to be done, our procedure turn needs to be done within 11 miles from Cozy. And so if we have RNAV, we're going to measure our distance directly from Cozy. If we don't, if we're using DME, it's coming from the localizer, ISVC. And in that case, Cozy is at 5.2. We'll add 11 to it. So our limit would be DME 16.2. Um, another common issue is just getting confused as to whether you're going to turn this way or this way. Believe it or not, when you're flustered and frustrated, it's really easy to try to turn the wrong way on a procedure turn. Um, and so that's definitely one. The last one, and I'm going to pull up um, Newport. Newport's got a VOR alpha. And last thing that kind of trips people up, especially on a check ride, if you don't have DME and you don't have GPS, how do you know when to fly your procedure turn? Because you'll notice this procedure does not require DME. It does not require RNF. And so people say, well, how will you know when you're within 10? And the answer there is time. Keep in mind that time is always an option that you can use. Okay, uh, looks like we had another question. Uh, we do. I don't have this one uh, up in front of me, but I'm just going to fire it off here on the, on the mic. Uh, and that is going back to the approach in liberal. Uh, if you want to pull that one up, Alex. Um, that is, can I ask ATC for a straight in approach starting at the intermediate fix? You can always ask. You can always ask ATC. They may or may not give it to you. Um, and it has to do with, I'm sure, their um, minimum altitudes and some of the limits. But you can always ask ATC um, if you can get a vector to final. On RNAV procedures, they can clear you direct to an intermediate fix in many cases and then clear you for a straight in procedure. Uh, otherwise, sometimes they just have to give you a vector to final. And so the answer here on this procedure is absolutely you can ask whether they can give it to you or you're not, I don't know. You know, I know in, in Hayden, um, which is out in the middle of kind of nowhere, Colorado, um, it's next to Steamboat. So it's where all the jets fly into for Steamboat. There's an ILS, people get vector to final all the time. And it's one of those places you wouldn't think that you can get a vector to final. But it's, it's one of those things where you can always ask for a straight in. And we've done that before. Um, though, that being said, there aren't that many places where I get to fly a full procedure turn. So when I get the opportunity, I usually do it. And I'm kind of half and half. Uh, in the modern avionics systems, I can let the RNAV system fly it. Though typically, I kind of like to try to do it, set up my wind correction, fly it by hand. Because I know RNAV will usually work. Uh, but... It, you get a little rusty not actually flying those procedures. So it's kind of fun to fly it by hand. OK, looks like we got another question. OK, we're going to throw this last one out here. It's a good question, something I haven't thought about in a long time. And that is, uh, does a procedure turn count for currency uh, in lieu of holding? Yes, as long as you do it under flight by reference to instruments, so you're wearing a hood 
or you're um, in the clouds, the holding pattern entry is all you need to count a hold. So um, if, you, if you fly that procedure entry in IMC and pop out and fly down final, that's your hold. Um, you know, and so um, I wouldn't exactly say it builds all the proficiency and timing in flying a holding pattern, but it does count uh, for the currency requirement. So that's kind of where I'll leave that. So that's all we've got for tonight, time-wise. I know procedure turns are something we could talk about forever because they are confusing. In fact, I think they're probably the most confusing part uh, about the IFR world when it comes down to flying an approach. So there's a link in the description. We'll, in two weeks, we'll be doing another one of these IFR lives. Um, and let us know what you'd like to hear about. If you want us to stay on procedure turns and take a look at that in detail, no PTs or RNAV, terminal approach areas and procedure turns, let us know. We'd be happy to cover it. Um, if there's something that you think we could explain better from here, let us know. We really would love to hear your feedback. As I said, our next, uh, our next show is in two weeks. That's April 2nd, same time. I hope to see you there. Good night.